Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is our penult penultimate talk of the day. Um, this is Dennis. He's going to be doing a talk on, you know, privacy leaks by dumpster diving, more or less, correct? Yeah. So if you ever get, you know, cool technology at eBay or uh, the Goodwill store or in the dumpster, maybe there's some stuff that got left over even after like a factory reset. So he's going to get into all that today. I think it's going to be pretty cool. Um, can everyone in here, everyone in the back, hear me okay? If I talked like this, would you really hear me okay? Okay. So you have to talk as loud as that. I was. Because <laughs> he's going to start talking and he's going to be like, "Can you hear me? It's it's pretty good talk, right, guys?" <laughs> See, <laughs> negative thumbs. So you gotta you gotta get real close. Are you ready? All right. I try. Um, can can you hear me in the back? Yes, maybe. Should I speak louder? Louder? Loud, loud enough? What about now? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, all right, um, so uh, welcome um, to my talk about uh, privacy leaks in smart devices. The introduction was mostly correct in terms of like dumpster diving. What I do more is like I shop on Amazon um, warehouse deals or like eBay. Um, and the main idea of this talk is about uh, to speak about uh, the extraction of data of used smart home devices. Um, so the outline for this talk is the following. Um, I start with the motivation when I will speak about um, how data is stored uh, or what kind of data is stored on IoT devices, then how is it stored, and what kind of reset states you can um, imagine if you get like a used device, um, what kind of data is maybe there or won't be there. Um, in the next um, um, topic, I would talk about the data, data extraction methods, so how you get the data off the device. And later on, I will have some example devices where I will tell, tell you um, how I got the data off and how I found, for example, like the previous owner of that. So some information about me. I'm a PhD student at Northeastern University, and I'm working there with uh, Professor Guevara Nabir. So we're doing mostly wireless security, but I, I'm kind of into this IoT stuff. Um, I'm also right now a grad student at the TU Darmstadt in Germany. I'm working there with um, Matthias Holik. And my main interest is like um, reverse engineering of any kind of interesting device. This can be nearly everything, but at the moment it's more like um, IoT and smart locks. Uh, but I do also physical locks, which is kind of like the same thing. And um, so you find me also in the tool uh, lock picking village. Some side notes about my talk. Um, it's not a Xiaomi bashing talk, so maybe some of you know me from last year where I was giving a lot of talks about Xiaomi. Um, the problem is I have only I have a lot of these devices, so basically I need to talk about them. Um, most of the methods I present are already known and used for other things. Um, there are some ethical and legal questions in this presentation, so I had to censor most of the data and like mock it up a little bit. Um, if you use any of the methods, for example, if you want to do like BGA on soldering and you break it, then it's kind of on you. I, I'm not responsible for that. And a lot of technical aspects I s s totally simplified. So basically, uh, NAND flash is way more complex, but I did it for, for the sake of the talk, uh, simplify. Um, and there's particular things which are out of the scope of this talk, for example, how to interpret um, NAND data or reassemble it, or for example, how to do device specific routing. I mean, there's a lot of manuals out there, so I won't cover that. So let's start with, with the motivation of this talk. Um, traditionally, um, we had like f nearly forever like the problem that there's a lot of second-hand devices which still contain data. Um, this issue lit literally existed forever since the hard drive exists, but it, it was increased as soon as people started to buy or sell um, hard drives on eBay. And most of these hard drives on eBay, they still contain data like some personal information, uh, emails, uh, pictures, or any other media, sometimes even sensitive documents if the government sold hard drives. And the awareness for this kind of topic was raised like in the beginning of uh, the 2000s. There was for example, like a paper where the researchers analyzed like what kind of data is still there and what, um, what you have to do to basically get rid of all the data. Um, interestingly, this um, not only affected like computers, but it also affected like multifunction printers or lab instruments. And uh, the NIST kind of recognized that in 2006, and they published a standard how to kind of wipe your devices to, to get rid of the data. And some of the solution was, for example, like you need to wipe your device and actually verify it, or you sell devices uh, without hard drive and uh, um, destroy the hard drive like in the one picture, which is like the example where you just shred it. Um, but there was still like a big problem, and the problem was that um, the lack of knowledge and awareness of the users. So, for example, most of the people didn't know how to securely re hard drives. They format their USB stick, and they thought like, okay, everything is fine. Um, some people didn't care. They said like, yeah, I have nothing to hide. And um, there's one particular problem if you have a broken device. For example, a broken laptop. Most people don't know how to remove the hard drive and to format it. Um, 
for a long time I thought this problem was actually kind of solved, but um, this year there have been like a study where someone bought like uh, 159 hard drives from eBay and 66 of them still contain data. So it's like still apparently like an issue. <laughs> The whole problem become a little bit more interesting uh, with smartphones because smartphones also contain a lot of data, sometimes even more than your personal computer. Pictures, all kind of pictures, uh, messages, account credentials, call lists. And one thing which people didn't know for a long time is that the phones are not encrypted by default, at least um, not up to 2014, 2015. So very long time the phones were not encrypted. And this was, this was only introduced with iOS 8, for example, by Apple in 2014 or with Android 6 in 2015. There have been some researchers who did an analyze on like um, how the devices uh, do the um, factory reset and they figured out that most devices actually don't do it correctly but still there's a lot of data. And this was kind of addressed again by NIST in 2014. They figured out okay smartphones is a big risk so um, we should address that in this new standard. So now the next uh, topic comes with IoT. Um, IoT in contrast to smartphones and uh, PCs has, has like a big difference and um, there's literally no a, a small or like no user interface um, available. So as a user you cannot really access directly the data which is on a device. Like you go in the file browser or something and look at that. Um, so you don't know what kind of data is also collected by this device. So um, you literally don't know anything about your device. If you do a factory reset then you cannot really verify that this device is really empty. Um, the other thing is you kind of don't know what kind of implementation of the factory reset was done by the vendor. So, and this depends from vendor to vendor, from device to device, and sometimes even from one version to another. So you could have a version which does it correctly and then the next version they do something completely different. So the main motivation for this talk is um, when I was writing my master thesis uh, at Zemo and uh, was analyzing a lot of security, uh, the security of a lot of uh, IoT devices, I had to do like a lot of root access methods and had to factory reset them regularly. And I figured out every time I do a factory reset with this device, all the data is still there or there's still data left. So I was kind of figuring out like, hey, maybe I should look into that. Um, another important thing is um, not only we as kind of hackers are interested in the data but other people are also uh, interested in the data and this is like an example from Germany where the police figured out like hmm smart devices that might be interesting to look at like for forensic to, to solve crimes. Um, so more and more people come now on the idea to um, actually do forensic analysis of um, IoT devices. Um, so this kind of talk is about like if you get a used device or if the cops bust your door and actually take your device so what kind of data you can expect there. All right. Let's talk about the data on IoT devices. Um, in general the data which you find on a device is basically dependent on the device type. There's different device types which contain more or less data. However there's one important thing which is like the same for all IoT devices and this is basically they need to have Wi-Fi credentials. Without Wi-Fi credentials it's not IoT because it cannot connect, connect to the internet. Um, the other thing what you most of the time have is like some kind of cloud credentials because the device needs to authenticate itself against the cloud to like upload data, to download data, whatever. Um, as a rule of thumb what I, what I found is the more performance functions or storage a device has, the more data is on it or will be collected. So this is like a thing if you have a very powerful device you can expect it, it definitely collects something. So let's start with the first kind of group of devices and those are the vacuum cleaning robots which most of the time additional to the credentials contain uh, connection lock files, maps, cleaning locks, user IDs and you see like an example for like um, uh, like a map um, like there on the screen. Um, I did analysis over a lot of vacuum cleaners. I have a lot of vacuum cleaners you see like a small collection there but I have even more. So I had a lot of fun with them. Um, another second group is uh, smart home gateways. Um, this can be anything which controls uh, any functions in your home. Um, they also uh, contain um, connection lock files, sensor actuators binding bindings. So for example if you have like any sensors in your home they know obviously what kind of sensors you have. Sometimes they collect also data in terms of like if sensors are triggered like temperature sensors you have like lock files about temperatures in your home. Um, depending on the device you might have also key material on it or like user ID again. The next group, cameras. Um, here again depending on what kind of camera you have, um, it might contain uh, cache snapshots or video clips, recorded video, event logs for example if you have this nice uh, doorbell cameras and they detect if someone is in front of it, then most of the time this device is sometimes, or sometimes this device is locked that. Um, it might contain again uh, user IDs and for, for cameras in particular they might have uh, cloud storage credentials because we need to upload like uh, video files to some kind of space and um, sometimes you can use the storage credentials to download data again so it's like depends on the device. 
Another thing which is not directly smart home, but uh, which is also important, are routers. Um, you can buy a lot of routers out of eBay, by the way. So um, people update them on a regular basis, but what they forgot is, forget actually is to erase them. And interesting information, for example, is there a DCP leases. So you see the MAC address to IP binding, you see the timestamps, you see the like, log files you can pro uh, potentially track down like when is a person is home or not home. Because if you go home, your smartphone is logging into your Wi Fi, so this kind of stuff is still stored in your device. Firewall configurations, so if you have any interesting service be um, behind um, like your firewall. Media files, there's like very powerful like media routers um, which contain also like media files and all kind of other log files, connections, DNS. Some people activate actually DNS logging on their router and sell it later, which is maybe not the best idea because you see all the DNS requests. And especially parents are a little bit paranoid and set like um, children, like you know, par parenting filters and other things, uh, other stuff, and also other credentials. So some people put whatever on in their router. Another interesting example: media players. Um, this is a kind of critical thing for me. <laughs> um, so they contain again lo um, um, connection logs. Sometimes, uh, or most of the time, media libraries, playlists, caches. Um, some people are using this kind of devices also for in their home to uh, browse on a TV. So basically we have Firefox or some other browser installed, we have their emails installed and so on. And they contain also um, credentials like for Google Play Store or for network shares. So people are using them to net for network shares. Um, there's one unfortunate thing which I had to change in my presentation. Um, and it's basically for ethical reasons I need to skip this device because uh, this device contains some interesting information or interesting pictures, let's say it so, um, with a very interesting taste. Um, I heard from someone el else that um, this is v not that uncommon that someone bought a PlayStation 3 and it contained also like a lot of adult movies and whatever. Um, another thing which I added also um, are toys. Um, most of the people don't know that toys can also record a lot of data. For example, I have this nice drone. Um, and these devices can also like record uh, audio and video data. And if you crash it, we have no way to reset it. And most of the time, like this device, you cannot reset it anyway in the first place. So, yeah. Right. Um, this is like a little bit more technical now, the storage of um, IoT devices. But this is like a little bit, um, this is actually important to understand why you kind of screwed up in particular situations. Um, if you talk about uh, storage on IoT devices, you have um, more or less two kinds of flash types which you use. You use the raw flash. Um, and the block devices. Um, for raw flash, the typical things which most of you probably know or see in IoT devices is SBI flash, uh, which can come in two flavors, NAND and NOR. For, for this presentation, we just stick to NAND. And uh, the parallel uh, NAND flash. Uh, parallel NAND flash is in the green box, more or less. There's also like different flavors of that. Uh, the other group are the block devices, which are EMMC, EMCP, which is like in your smartphone, or SD cards. And depending what kind of uh, storage type you have chosen, it affects more or less the, um, the selection of file systems which you can use for your IT device. And this becomes more or less later, uh, uh, this becomes important later for the forensic analysis. Um, let's start first with the, with the raw NAND flash. Um, if you have SPI flash, for example, most of the time it's like smaller than 64 megabyte. And you see it like in small packages like, um, let's see, like in this kind of uh, like eight pin package. If you have bigger uh, sized uh, NAND flash, then um, it's most of the time like parallel NAND flash, it's a raw NAND. And um, this can vary from 128 megabyte to 4 gigabyte. And it can come in all kind of different like uh, packages like BGA or TSOP or whatever. Um, the reason why vendors are liking the, uh, love this kind of flash is because it's cheap and fast. Um, but the problem with that is that it has, uh, that it produces a lot of bit errors which you need to correct. And you see on the right how the access is going. So basically we have the uh, raw NAND flash and um, this is connected to the host processor and the host processor in this case need to take care of their leveling, the ECC correction and the bad block management. If you work with Linux, this is usually done by the memory technology devices subsystem which takes care of that and it basically converts the character device into a block device and it kind of takes care of all the things for you. Um, if we take a closer look like to the properties of NAND flash, um, then what you see at some point is that it's organized in blocks, which are then organized uh, like in blocks and pages, and the block contains multiple pages. The problem with NAND flash is if you want to erase data, you need to erase a whole block, which contains a lot of pages. Um, and the erasing of uh, a block means basically you set all the things to, to one. Um, the typical size of these blocks are between uh, 16 and 512 kilobyte. So if you want to, to erase like one particular small area of memory, then you need to erase like 512 kilobytes and you need to copy them somewhere. 
interestingly, the programming works on page level. So the programming, you can do it on, uh, on two kilobyte. But if you want to erase it, you need to erase a big block. Um, the other thing, in, in addition to the data um, space, there's also like an out-of-band data uh, space, which is uh, for management and for ECC reasons. Um, because NAND flash is so unstable, a lot of vendors are adding a lot of, uh, some like two percent of uh, additional blocks for spare. So if um, if you have like a lot of bad blocks, then basically they are used for that. And again, like I said, the ECC is computed by the host CPU. And the problem here at some point is that depending on what kind of host CPU you use or NAND controller, it can do particular computations differently. So you you cannot really swap one flash to another, maybe uh, like and read it out. So. Let's talk about rare leveling of raw flash. Um, and, the, and the problem with uh, raw flash is basically that individual flash cells have very limited uh, uh, lifetimes and writes. So you can write on one cell only 1,000 times. And file systems like X2, X3, X4 are not uh, rare leveling aware. So basically, if you run an X2 uh, or X3 system, uh, file system on an end flash uh, without any other layer in between, it will just destroy it with like multiple writes as soon as you write too much. And the solution for that is basically that you have flash aware file systems or additional layer. So on the right side, you see like one example. You might have like a, um, a JFFS2, for example, is like a file system which is like flash aware, which works on the partition layer a level. And um, the other thing what you can do is like you can add an additional level between the flash and the file system. And this is um, an example for that is like UB or UBF, uh, UBFS. And this works on the whole level. There's a particular uh, pro and cons for the decision, but this is like more or less depends on the vendor what they want to do. This is not that important for now. But uh, the thing here is that the support for the bad block management and where leveling is again done in the operation system. And the main idea of that is, um, of this where leveling in particular, um, deleted blocks are not erased because that would cause again like many writes. Instead, they are just marked as dirty or deleted, and uh, the actual change information is copied into a new block. And at some point, if necessary, the garbage collector will take care of like the old data. But if you don't need to take care of it, then it stays there. I did a graph for that, um, so this is again simplified. So um, bear with me; it's like uh, not totally correct in terms of like terms. Um, but imagine we have like a data block. This one, which we want to change, and it's assigned to the um, use block, um, the physical use block there. And now, what happens is, if you want to change it, the original, the old use block is read. Then the information with the modified information is written to a new free block. Um, the link is more or less um, se set to the new block, and the old block is just marked as dirty. And the important thing, uh, thing here is, the data is still present. The data is not erased; it's still there. Um, the interesting thing, in particular for IoT, is if you if you change a particular file more often, then you have more more and more copies of that. So uh, the thing is, you have multiple copies on Flash, um, and this data is also not erased as long as the, this whole block is not erased. And if you have some data in there which is never touched, then it's probably never erased. Um, the interesting thing for us is uh, to reverse engineer or like to extract data is basically that the copies have like a size bigger than two kilobytes, so you can put like a text file, credentials file, or whatever into that. And the more data gets changed, for example, log files or Wi-Fi credentials or pictures, uh, the more copies you have in NAND flash. So basically, it's like kind of like a backup, just without being a backup. Um, so this was super simplified. If you are more interested in that, there's a great talk uh, from the back at uh, USA 2014 about a reverse engineering flash memory for fun, fun and benefit from Matt O. And you have given like an introduction into the communication protocol of NAND, um, the soldering, unsoldering of NAND flash, and how to reverse engineer the um, NAND formats. Uh, another interesting talk is also like from, uh, or it's a block entry actually, uh, from NAND chips to files um, from uh, John M uh, Michael Picot. And uh, this is also like a recommended thing. As a side note, by the way, even vendors of devices are not aware of particular features of their file systems. For example, this is like from uh, this is an example from my talk last year at DEF CON, um, where developers leaked actually like a key, um, where developer keys in the JFFS2 file system. So they basically deleted the file and just imaged the whole file system and put it on millions of devices. And all the millions of devices still had like somewhere the fragments of the key. So even vendors are not safe from that. Let's talk about block devices. Um, so block devices are in general known as managed NAND. Um, we have multiple standards, uh, uh, EMMC4, EMMC5. The higher the standard, the more difficult it gets for us as reverse engineers or like forensics. Um, the classical thing that most people know is like EMMC. And uh, EMMC, in techni uh, technically speaking, is a flash with integrated controllers. So basically the controller is like 
on the chip, so it's not necessary anymore that you have that you do the bare leveling or the other things in like in uh, like on the operation system. Um, another flavor of um, of this kind of uh, memory is eMCP, and this is typical things which you find on your smartphone um, because it's basically eMMC with an additional DRAM on one chip. And the advantage is you for the vendor for the supply chain, basically you have only one chip. It contains DRAM and flash at the same time. You see, it gets a little bit more complicated with the pins down down there. Um, under Linux, these devices are kind of seen as normal uh, block storage devices, like an SD card, and so they support all file systems x2, x3, x4. Um, and the advantage of them kind of is like for complexity reasons that um, the wear leveling, the ECC, and the bad block management is already integrated in them, so you don't have to take care of that. Now, if you want to access deleted data, then it gets a little bit more complicated because the EMMC controller doesn't really allow us to get raw access on the on the on the device like with a raw NAND. Um, so, but the thing is that the, this kind of chips we're using a raw NAND internally, and there are like possibilities where you can just um, bypass the EMMC controller and directly attach to the NAND internally and just bypass all the security things. Um, the challenge is just that some EMMC controllers are doing some kind of weird format, so you need to figure out what, what we do internally. Again, recommended talk here is uh, the EMMC chips, data recovery beyond the controller, uh, by a company who is doing like a lot of um, recovery things, Resolute, I think. And the summary is basically, even if you delete all the data from the EMMC, all the data is still in there, in the, in the, in the, in the chip, so you can extract it. Uh, but this is a little bit out of scope for this talk. All right. Um, Let's talk about reset states, which you can find if you buy like a used device, or if you do dumpster diving, or if your neighbor gives you some broken device. So the reset states most of the time depend on the previous owner. So some previous owner think like, yeah, I have nothing to hide. So for example, for this media box, um, for the critical one, um, I don't need to, to reset it at all. So basically, this device contains still all the data, all the configurations. Um, and one of the reasons why it might be the case is that the knowledge is just missing, so the people don't know how to reset this stuff thing. Another level, which can be uh, the buffer configuration reset. So this device might still contain all the data, or most of the data, but it's like in an unprovisioned state. That means if you power it on, it won't connect to any Wi-Fi. It expects more or less you to provision it again to your new Wi-Fi. And um, interestingly, many devices only offer this Wi-Fi reset. Uh, so basically, if you see a reset button on your device, then most of the time it's a Wi-Fi reset. It's not the device wipe, which is the next thing. Um, device wipes, in contrast to that, they just delete all the data, re uh, put the device back in a factory state, and um, but even in this case, there might be still traces of data there. Um, interestingly, not all the devices support that because it's basically you know, from technical reasons. If they build the device incorrectly, then they can't just wipe the device. So, in comparison, both. So some devices actually support both features. Um, so Wi-Fi reset is usually marked by a special button. If you have a reset button, you click it. Um, it's by basically doing a Wi-Fi reset. Um, device wipe um, is usually available over the app if you have an app, or you need to press like multiple keys. And now the idea of this Wi-Fi reset is like a very logical one. So basically, you don't want to erase the whole device every time you do want to change the Wi-Fi. So basically, this device can be reconnected quickly to a new Wi-Fi. So you don't have to wait like for five minutes or ten minutes until the flash gets erased. So you want to just move the move, move the thing. In contrast to that, I mean, as with the device wipe, you want to erase you, all the data and you want to get get rid of everything and get bring it back in a factory mode. But this is like these things are like not necessary the same in terms of like um, what people understand under reset you know so it's basically for people think they reset the device most of the time it's a Wi-Fi reset all right let's talk about that data extraction methods um, for me the idea is extract all available da data everything which I can get from this device and there are multiple methods to do that for example if I somehow can get root access on a device then I can extract it by software um, sometimes I can fl dump the flash contents uh, without actually disordering anything. In the worst case, I need to disorder like the flash, for example. So this is like typically the chip-off method. So if you talk about software methods, uh, for many IoT devices, especially for the cheap ones, where like some public um, method uh, methods are available, where you, uh, people tell you how to access like the file system, how to root the device, how to do like whatever. Um, and most devices support also like uh, installation of custom firmware or access over USB, for example, AD, for example ADB um, or UART. Um, for some devices, especially for cameras, there's like some special modes where you can boot a system from the uh, SD card, for example. And if you have now a root shot at some point, what you, the thing what you want to do is like basically dump all the flash contents via a DD. 
um, the advantage for DD is basically DD is not flash aware, so it doesn't know anything about out of uh, out of um, data blocks, um, out of band blocks, or ECC. So it just dumps everything, um, which is very helpful for us. Usually, you shouldn't use DD, by the way, if you ever do backups of NAND flashes because you can't restore them again without breaking your system. Um, you extract the data usually by external media, SSH, or NETCAT. NETCAT is most, probably the most easiest thing to do. Uh, this method with software works especially good for uh, file systems if it's like JFFS2 or UBFS. The disadvantage here is you can only do things with the kernels allowing you. So basically, sometimes the kernel is not allowing you low level access on the flash, so you might be a little bit limited there. Um, the other thing which you can do is like um, you can dump flash without disordering, and it works mainly go very good for SPI flash or EMMC. Um, some of the devices, if you get them, they allow in system programming. And how it works, basically, you take your uh, flash reader and you attach it to particular test pins, and you, then you can directly access the memory. The problem is um, the processor shouldn't interfere with this process, so you need to kind of make sure that the processor or the SOC is kind of like not working. And you can do that um, sometimes by pulling like the reset pin, or you just ground the uh, clock, the crystal, so that it doesn't do anything. The adv advantage of this thing is, well, you have a reduced risk of destroying the hardware. If you're not very good in BGA resoldering or like um, unsoldering, then you probably break your device. The disadvantage is you need to fight the test pins first or the, the traces. And some vendors do, um, with four layer PCBs, they do so that they hide things like in the middle layers and this kind of nasty. Um, the last method of resort is more or less dumping the flash by disordering. So this works literally for all the flash methods, uh, for the, all the flash chips. Um, I'm confused. Well, okay. So, how does okay? Um, how does it works is usually that um, the recommended thing is you p uh, heat up the PCB um, before you do any soldering because if you don't heat up the PCB, then um, at some point you might accidentally pull pins because you have like a ground plane. Um, if you have accessible pins for like for TSOP, um, one one trick which you can do is like basically you create like a low temperature alloy, and low temperature alloy you just take like a um, like an alloy uh, like a soldering alloy which is like 120 137 uh, degrees Celsius, and then you just mix it with the existing alloy, and you can do that uh, with a normal soldering iron, so you don't need too much special tools. For BGA chips, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, you most of the time need like some hot air station, infrared, or a flow oven. Or for soldering station. Some people use also a pizza oven, but I might not recommend that. Um, in general, the disadvantage of PGA chips is um, if you want to reuse the device later, you need to um, reboil the, the chip and um, to resolder it, and this might be complicated and might be re might require a lot of um, patience. Um, especially one one thing about NAND devices is that you might need um, a special adapter to use them because of the high pin count. All right. Let's start with the tools which you need to do, uh, which, you, which you can use for particular things. Um, if you want to access SPI flash, um, you can literally take any device which can bit do big bit banging on GPIOs. You can use a Raspberry Pi, you can use Arduinos, you can use bus pirates. Uh, for Raspberry Pi, you have the software flash ROM, which can natively speak to most of the um, flash chips. So uh, that's kind of easy. My favorite tool, because I use it also for other things, is FlashCat USB, which is I don't know, a couple like 30, 30, 40 bucks or so. Um, this this also for that purpose. Um, if you if you want to access EMMC flash, um, the advantage of EMMC flash is it speaks the same protocol like SD cards, so you can use potentially like SD card readers. Um, here, the important thing is you want to double check the data sheet of the EMMC flash because some of them are low voltage, so it's like 1.8 volt. If you connect it with 3.3, then you have a very hard time, and you need to buy new devices. Um, one very cheap method is here. Um, there's a, like an um, Exploiteers uh, EMMC adapter for 10 bucks, uh, which you can get. You can just connect it into a SD card reader. You solder the um, um, the cables uh, um, to to the chip, and you can can read it out. The disadvantage of that is um, the chips are very small, and um, so you might have good eyes to do that, or you need a microscope or something. Um, and uh, the disadvantage of this particular method is also that you might not be able to access all the partitions, which might be, which is actually not a real problem for us in this our use case of getting data from those devices. But if you do more reverse engineering, you also want to access the special partitions like the boot partitions. But this doesn't matter here. Um, another method, um, by the way, for EMMC flash is if you get some cheap stuff from China, like this uh, BGA adapters, where you can just put your 
BGA chip in there and jiggle a little bit around and then get a very good connection. Um, the advantage of this is that they support dual voltage, uh, dual, dual voltage chips. So uh, you should be good to go with that. This advantage is with that, by the way, um, you need to find the correct position of the, uh, of the chip, so you need to try a little bit. And I wouldn't recommend to use the original software because it's detected as malware. And the typical recommendation of the developers of the software is, yeah, it's fine, just to say we're antivirus and uh, doesn't sound very um, trustworthy. All right. Um, if you want to access uh, raw NAND, this gets a little bit more complicated because the pin count gets higher. So you need like at least um, uh, I think 16 pins uh, which you need to connect um, to the chip. Um, and this requires some kind of NAND controller. You can again look into the uh, talk about reverse engineering flash memory for fun and benefit. They have like very, very cheap method to do that. But again here there's like more or less professional um, devices available where you can just um, use like a socket to put the chip in and read it out. Um, and dump all the data. The problem with that kind of devices is um, most of the time that they cannot interpret uh, the ECC or out of band data, so it might be a hit or miss. Um, another method, if you have access to that, evaluation boards. So just take a look at the processor which is used in your device. So I did a lot of vacuum cleaners, I have some development boards which I have exactly the same chip. So you can just sort the, ch the, the chip onto this evaluation board and can just use the processor like it is to read and dump the, all the information and can I also use it to write information to that without thinking on how to calculate the ECC and how to do other things. Um, the disadvantage of this method is obviously you need to get this board somehow and sometimes they're not available or if they're available they're extremely expensive so it's kind of yeah, difficult. Um, at the moment we extracted the data there's like a lot of, um, there's a whole zoo of tools which you can use. Um, the typical thing that most people just do is like bin walk. Um, if you just extract, if you w just want to extract some data like credentials, then you can just use a hex editor. Um, at some point, if you want to interpret uh, NAND flash dumps, um, there's like some tools like the dump flash tool or uh, NAND dump tool. The problem with this particular tools is, um, even though that they open source, um, they don't handle exotic out of band data sizes correctly sometimes, or also the ECC data is kind of like uh, difficult. So it depends more or less on the SOC which was used. If you at some point have like a UB image, you can just dump the whole content of that. Um, JFFS e images, uh, it's, it's also easy, there's like also tools for that. So basically for most of the things, you have open source tools available, um, you should be good to go with that. All right, let's start with the device analysis. Um, so some of the methods which I use, um, where basically disassemble the device, um, unsolder the flash, dump the flash, put the flash on again, then power the device on again and um, maybe try to root it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, the one thing which I try to do is like, I basically try to connect the device also to the app. So as a new user kind of, I connect to, um, the, the device to the app and hope that I still get some old information. Um, the other thing is like as a kind of test I do, um, I use the devices, for example, uh, I ran vacuum cleaners in my, uh, in my lab and then I reset them and then I just compare the data which I had before and after that. So to get an idea what kind of, how good the factory reset is. So the first device where I would start is uh, the Ecovacs DBOT 900. I think it's mostly, it's very popular in Europe. I'm not sure how popular it is in America. I got this device in 2019 and the previous owner told me that he erased it. So I was kind of curious about that. This thing runs Linux. Um, it has this weird uh, rock chip, a uh, SOC, and they use a 128 megabyte of uh, NAND flash in TSOP um, 48 format. So you see like this green thing on the, on the left. Um, the approach that I used is basically I dumped the NAND flash and I, when I connected over UI to get some additional information uh, to figure out what's going on. After I unsolded the flash, I wanted to verify um, but it, but this device was actually factory reset it because otherwise it's kind of like uh, a little bit unfair. And the thing is what I found is actually that um, I found a log file w which is w where it says that this device was erased before I got it. So basically it was, it was newing for sure that this device was erased. The next thing what I found there is like lo lots, lots of fragments of log files, keys, maps, Wi-Fi credentials. The only problem with what I had with this particular device is that I didn't know how to, how to, int, uh, how to read uh, the out of band data to reassign all the blocks correctly. So this is like still something which I'm working on. Um, the next step what I did is I connect, connected over UART and was hoping that I can get some shell to extract the data very easy but unfortunately they did um, protect that by making the uh, 
like you are to read only, but I found some information about it. So the one information I could figure out is that the rock chip is using a very specific like driver to communicate with the uh, with the flash, and they do a uh, variable link by themselves. And the other thing what I knew is um, that the root partition is squashfs, and that the data partition X4 is X4. So um, basically, I could expect that I find more more traces. So. This is like the example with the credentials. So basically, um, this device, um, at some point, you need obviously to have files which store the credentials. And what you can see here from the, from the top to the bottom, uh, this was the original file which was created in the factory. So you still see the factory credentials of the, uh, the SSID and the Wi Fi password for the factory somewhere in Shenzhen or wherever this vacuum cleaner was designed. And over the time, when the, vac when the previous owner was adding Wi Fi or was connecting this device to the Wi Fi, you see that more and more Wi Fi were like, added to this. Um, the ever I had to censor things, so the blue things are censored. Um, the other thing, what you see out of the log files is every time uh, when the vacuum cleaner was connected to the Wi-Fi or when the original point where the owner was provisioning this device first time to the Wi-Fi. So in this case, I knew that this, the, the person had like a Galaxy phone because you can see it in the in the log files that the Galaxy phone was connected to this. So. Now we have some info of the information. So what about locating the former owner? And um, there's like a very useful uh, API for that, the Google Ge Geolocation API. And what it does is you give it uh, two MAC addresses and, it uh, and the signal strength, and it gives you back the coordinates and the accuracy rating. Um, the problem with this particular device was, um, unfortunately, I had only one MAC address, so I couldn't use this API to find the original position of that. Um, but there's another website where you can just enter the SSID and then you can just look around the world where this SSID is coming from. And the thing about this particular SSID is that it was like a provider modem which had like a random, random number as an SSID so I found exactly only one um, position where this SSID was used. I had a second SSID from the same owner. I checked, double checked it and figured out it's somewhere in the middle of Germany. So I, I have also the exact address but I didn't have it here. Um, Right. So, as a summary for this particular device, uh, most of the user data were still existing on this device, even though it was wiped. Um, I could see the XMMP log files. Um, this device is using XMMP for the communication with the cloud. Um, I could see the maps, the credentials. Um, because the maps are using some kind of weird format, I couldn't really reassemble them, but I might at some point. I also tried to reset this device three times in a row and still could get all the fragments. So, factory resetting is not very effective there. Um, one in interesting aspect is I also found the factory logs, so where the sensors and all the other stuff was tested, and I think these files are actually not existing anymore in the logical space, but we're still on this thing. Um, again, I could tr uh, track the previous owner of this device. However, there's one small good news. Um, if you connect this vacuum cleaner now to the, to the um, Wi-Fi and to your uh, account, then basically the app doesn't leak previous information, so it's kinda, this is kind of okay. So the data is apparently not there anymore in a form that everyone can see it. Um, the interesting thing is I found uh, the similar results also for other vacuum cleaners. Um, not sure if, I mean, everyone who's using um, this kind of raw NAND chips is kind of like want to save money, so a lot of devices have, have exactly the same issue. Right. Um, the second device which I analyzed, um, because I do many research on Xiaomi, so I bought uh, random used devices and broken devices out of eBay. Um, this is a device which I got in 2018. Um, I didn't really know what kind of condition it had because it was broken. Um, in general, the Xiaomi devices, they, have, uh, they run an Ubuntu 14.04 uh, with a quad-core ARM and they have uh, 4 gigabyte of eMMC. And here the approach was that I connect over uh, UART and dump the partitions um, over UART and then later on I try to connect it again to the cloud. Um, the good thing about the Xiaomi vacuum cleaners is that routing methods exist. Um, I found them, I think, two years ago and presented them. Um, you can get root shell over UART or you just can push your custom firmware onto that. The good thing with cu pushing custom firmware is it doesn't destroy the data, so the data is still there, so which is kind of good. Um, and later on you can exfiltrate all the data via SSH. Um, the alternative mod method is if this device is totally broken, um, you can still remove and dump the flash content. That still works. Um, to give you a, like an idea for what to look for, um, this system, this is like the EMMC layout, um, how it looks like. So you see that it has like three copies of the operation system. Uh, then on the um, pre last line, there's the reserve partition, which contains all the usage data. So how much, how often this device was used? Um, what is the status of like all the sensors, the um, HEPA filter, and so on? And then there's a user partition, which is the UDISC partition, which contains all the logs, uh, maps, Wi Fi configuration, and user ID. Um, and this is like the partition which we're interested for. So 
uh, one thing about this vacuum cleaners in particular, this device is actually support two modes of uh, reset. So the first thing is uh, Wi-Fi reset, which is uh, which is a button which is called reset, um, and the second is like the uh, uh, factory reset. Um, the Wi-Fi reset, what it does is just deletes the Wi-Fi credentials, but everything else remains there. And the, act the factory reset re needs a special procedure where you need to, to press multiple buttons to wait, and then it resets uh, the device in the factory. Um, it's mentioned in the manual, but I figured out that nearly no one knows about it. So probably the first thing what you do is like if you get the manual, you just throw it away. <laughs> and um, yeah, what this factory reset actually is doing is it restores the um, operation system from the recovery and the formats the data partition. But interestingly here is it doesn't wipe it really, so there might be still some traces. Um, the partition of the usage data is not erased, so basically all the usage data is still there, but not kind of the user data. So what I did is I just connected it then to the cloud and I figured out, oh hey, um, all the data is still visible in the app, so I could figure out like, okay, when, when was the apartment cleaned of the person, what the apartment is looking like, and um, so the assumption was that this device was only Wi-Fi resetted, so they pressed only the, the reset button, nothing more, um, and even though that I connected it to a totally different account, uh, this device was re-uploading all the data from the vacuum cleaner up in the cloud, so I had it as a new owner, I had all the previous data before. Also, all the log files were still um, locally available, and I was kind of curious what happens if I do a factory reset. So at the end of the day, I did the factory reset. The good news is if you do like a real factory reset and press the real buttons, then the data is at least not visible in the app anymore. Um, I was looking at the log files and figured out, hey, I have two MAC addresses, <laughs> um, and actually the Geo, uh, the Google Geo API have given me like some coordinates back and. Um, I figured, I mean, I again censored it, so it's like somewhere in the area, but I knew the exact address. Um, as soon as I knew the address, I was looking at the, at the street and I figured out that the Wi Fi credentials have, uh, the SSID had part of the street name in it and the street number because, I don't know, someone figured out it's maybe a good idea to use the street name and street number as a Wi Fi SSID. And the password contained some uh, personal information, like probably the doc's name, I don't know, not sure. Um, however, because this data is like stored in plain text in the device, you can just read it out. Another magic trick is, by the way, um, the device has the user ID of the user, and if you use like the app, you can share devices with other users. And one thing what I did is basically I created like a fake account, connected like a fake device, and then I was just sharing this device with this user, with the previous owner, and had also the profile picture and the name. So yeah, yeah. Um, so as a summary, um, for this particular device, all the data was still there. The device was not was not wiped. Um, said only Wi-Fi reset was done. Um, the reset button is very misleading, like for many devices. So reset is not doing actually reset. Um, however, in this case, the pr correct procedure is actually documented in the manual. But most of the people don't read that. Um, again, here I could track the owner um, with the due to the log files. And this kind of devices they create a lot of log files and very verbose. So you have like a nice um, nice idea what's going on there. All right. Um, some other example which I have here um, are like these doorbells. I figured out like I have like now I think eight doorbells, and seven of them are more or less from the same I think SDK. Um, in terms of like um, if you buy like eight uh, doorbells from Amazon, you have probably um, internally seven times the same hardware, but the different interior uh, like exterior. Most of them are based on the High 3518 chip. Um, they have like an SBI um, NOR flash in there. They use again JFS2 and UBFS, so you can happily um, recover all the credentials. Um, they have some log files, so you might get one MAC address of the of the Wi-Fi access point. So it's kind of like a little bit more difficult, but potentially you could track it down. The sad thing about this kind of devices is they have unfortunately like a, a SD card slot, so they don't contain video data. So I was like a little bit sad about that. Um, not necessarily all IoT devices are bad. So I found actually one device which I didn't disclose yet, um, which was also a vacuum cleaner from a different company who used Trust Zone for key storage. They encrypted all the user partitions with looks. Um, the, um, the keys were managed by this trust trusted execution engine and were device specific. And every time this thing boots up, it checks like some states and then unlocks the partitions. The interesting thing here is if you do a factory set, it just throws away the keys and recreates the partition. So in this kind of case, it would be kind of safe. But this is like this is one example I, I saw so far. So it's very, very rare. Um, as a conclusion, um, in general, I had like a sample size of like 26 devices, which I found, uh, got, or found like on, on like some swap, swap fests. Um, I figured out that apparently um, secure or correct factory sets are very difficult to implement, um, especially if you use raw NAND uh, flash. It 
nearly defeats all the time, like uh, full wipes. And there's no real way to ensure that the device has actually vaped. Uh, vaped, uh, vaped sorry. Um, many, also many vendors are actually not to release all the user generated data. So you have like usage data which still remains there, log files are not erased. Um, the only thing that sometimes is erased is like the Wi-Fi configuration files, um, but all the other information is more or less still like on this device. Um, another problem what you have again is uh, the missing knowledge of the user. So if the people don't know how to reset devices then in, in the first place then we cannot even complain about the vendors because the user don't reset them. Um, as a re recommendation, if you ever want to get rid of um, devices, uh, don't sell them and throw them away. Um, especially if you expect that they contain any sensitive information. So especially, don't throw away like this media stuff, uh, the media players. Um, and also, don't throw away devices if you cannot verify that they have been uh, done a full wipe. One example is destroy the physical memory if it's a cheap device, or just use this device to practice soldering, to unsolder, resolder things. Um, in general, it might be a good idea if you had to throw away devices, maybe cha change your Wi-Fi credentials so at least that someone cannot, like, who has the credentials cannot break into your local network. Or the other thing is just put all your uh, devices into a separate IoT Wi-Fi, which kind of also limits the impact if someone gets the credentials. All right, um, that's it uh, for here. I want to thank, uh, uh, thank Professor Nubir and uh, Professor uh, John Manfredelli from uh, the Northeastern University and also the Zemo team from TU Darmstadt. And if you have any questions, I'm happily here to answer them. And I have also some devices. If you want to take a look at this kind of weird adapters, I'm here for a while. Thank you.